Yeah, assalamualaikum and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending our monthly um, webinar for neuroemergency, uh, which is brought by the neuroemergency uh, special interest group. So today uh, we are very fortunate uh, to have uh, excellent speakers, um, uh, well-known speakers, I would say. So um, it has been a year since we launched this uh, monthly webinar. Basically, is to educate people not to be scared of uh, neurology. Yeah? Um, I know it is uh, sometimes can be a bit difficult, but uh, it is not impossible for you to master it, basically. Uh, and therefore, without further ado, I would like to invite a consultant emergency physician, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Chow Chi Tong. Uh, he's an emergency physician currently working in Hospital Sebran Jaya. Um, well known in stroke, uh, he's backhand of Dr. Irene basically uh, at ETD. So um, without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Chow. Um, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Hey, thank you, Nina. Good morning, everyone. So uh, let us welcome the first speaker, my good mentor, Dr. Irene Louis. Dr. Irene Louis is a senior consultant uh, neurologist Jusasi in uh, Spranjaya Hospital, Penang. She is also the head of a clinical research center of Hospital Spranjaya. So she completed her clinical fellowship training in stroke in National uh, Neuroscience Institute in Singapore in 2019 and has extensive list of publications and involved in many phase three clinical trials. Dr. Irene is a uh, as we all know, the Iron Lady in Stroke. Hospital Sebangjaya was the first MOH hospital in Malaysia that provide thrombolysis service since year 2012, spearheaded by Dr. Irene. And she also developed prices. Uh, the, uh, this is the precious of uh, Dr. Irene, uh, which uh, spells for a uh, Pri Regional Integrated Stroke Intervention System in 2020 which is a hub and spoke uh, stroke care network to cater for the cluster hospitals of uh, Hospital Sprang Jaya and to offer better stroke care for the community. So today, uh, Dr. Irene will be sharing with us uh, approach to ophthalmoplegia. Dr. Irene, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Chow. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, thank you for participating on the, on the Saturday morning, you know, like, uh, is uh, I can see that the weather over in Penang is very good. Uh, okay, so uh, I would I would do I will make when I prepare my slide. I was just thinking, do I want to make it something that you know, like you all everyone can use when you see the patients in the emergency uh, uh, department. You know, likewise for emergency physician or for medical department MO uh, or physician. Or do I want to teach you about the anatomy and the pathway of, you know, the of the cranial of the uh, ocular ocular cranial nerve? So in the end, uh, I I decided that I'm going to make it simple and easy, so that at the end of it, you will you will know when you have a patient that come to emergency department or a patient that come to medical department or medical clinic or health clinic, they come to you complaining of diplopia. And how would you approach it? Okay, how would you approach the uh, this patient who has the uh, you know like uh, you know like what come to your mind? Okay, so uh, if you cannot remember much, uh, I'm just going to teach you about the six step of approach. Okay, of patient with diplopia. So to make it easy, right? I'm going to I'm not going to talk much about pathway and then you know structure you know of the eye in between the eye you know like uh, orbital apex and then cavernous sinus I know when I mention all this word everybody's uh, you know like the the the, the brain slowly start to shut down already okay so I'm not going to do that I'm going to make it easy you know that when you look at them it come to your mind okay is it is it this? Is it monoocular? Is it biocular? Okay. Or, you know, like, is this uh, any focal neurological sign? I I'll teach you step by step. And then at the end of it, I will randomly choose one participant or two or three participants, okay, to revert back to me what I thought about this six step of uh, new neuro ophthalmology uh, examination. Okay. So that to make sure that you are listening. Okay. Otherwise, sometimes when we do Zoom meeting, the speaker will be top, 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 and then the participant off the video. 
Okay. Uh, no, I don't think you all will off and then don't listen, but uh, it's just interactive. Okay. So I'm going to randomly choose. So uh, make sure you all remember the six step. Okay. Okay. So I will start now. Okay. Uh, okay. I will start now. Approach the automobile. So part one, we I'll give you a simplified approach to patient with diplopia arrive at emergency department. Okay. So introduction, the, the six step approach. And then the further approach to localize the lesion, such as isolated cranial nerve palsy of three, four, six, okay? Multiple cranial nerve palsy, orbital apex, cavernous sinus, of course, other causes, okay? And trauma. And then the imaging modality and then conclusion. So these are the outline of my talk uh, today, okay? So introduction, diplopia or double vision, represent 0.1% of all presenting complaints to emergency department. It can be a, a result of a benign cause, such as cataract, you know, or can be like refractive error, like our people like us who pull back glasses, or life-threatening etiology, such as a compressive aneurysm or tumor and raised intracranial pressure. Therefore, it is important for us to assess diplopia and recognize whether this is something benign or this is something life-threatening or whether it is something that we need urgent referral, okay, and neuroimaging. And if we want neuroimaging, what do we need? Do we do you think that CT scan is good enough or do we need to proceed with MRI, okay? So this is the simplified approach, six-step six approach. Don't worry about this diagram. I'm going to six, show this diagram again later, okay? Number one, the six-step. One, two, three, four, five, six. Number one, is it monocular or binocular? Number two, is, it, is there a focal neurological symptom? Number four, then we'll start to do our ocular, extraocular motility testing. I mean, you ask the patient to look to the, to the right, to the left, up and down. Very simple, right? So for, for you know, like uh, medical, I mean, like for physician, usually sometimes we, we do a H, we ask them to do a neurological uh, eye examination in a H, right? We ask them to look to the left, to the right, okay? Oh, sorry, left, right. Then we ask them to look up there and then look down there. And then we look to the left side and then up again and then down again in a H, okay? In a H, uh, what do you call that? Direction, okay? With that, majority of us can pick up something already. Okay, so this is motility testing. Then number four, ask ourselves, whether is there a sixth nerve or third cranial nerve palsy? Okay, I'll, I'll go to that later. And then number five, uh, sometimes it is not sixth nerve and uh, third nerve only. It is more than that, you know, there is more cranial nerve that is involved. Okay, that is like, you know, like sometimes they will have fifth cranial nerve, okay? And then the pupil may be involved, okay? The, and then sometimes the visual equity, which is second cranial nerve will be involved. So if it is that case, then at the back of mind, we need to do a semi-urgent MRI to evaluate the issue, okay? And of course, all patients above 60 years old, we need to consider giant cell arthritis and then do a full blood count, ESR, and see reactive protein. Because this giant arthritis is something reversible. You just give a high dose steroid, and then poof, they will, you know, like recover. Okay. Uh, and uh, but uh, if we don't do anything, patient will go blind. Okay. So let's go through again. Is it binocular or monocular? Is there any focal neurological symptom, especially brainstem brain stem symptom? If yes, activate stroke protocol. You know, like sometimes patient will say, I can see well, you know, diplopia. Then you examine, hey, he got hemiparesis as well, okay? And uh, all, you know, like facial weakness, okay? So think at the end of mind, think about whether it's stroke, okay? If there is no other associated neurological symptom of sign, then we do our motility testing, which is the H, okay? And uh, whether there's any third and sixth cranial nerve palsy, and then all patients with third cranial nerve palsy require urgent CTA of the brain to rule out aneurysma compression. Third nerve palsy, you know, we have to rule out whether it is a, whether it is a PICA, PICA uh, compression. PICA, which is, what is PICA? P-I-C-A. 
posterior, uh, sorry, I forgot, posterior, inferior, cerebellar artery. Okay, the pica. No, 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 communicating artery, right? Yeah, okay. So, uh, and then the mortality, is the mortality complex do not point to isolated cranial nerve, consider MRI, evaluate cavernous sinus or semi-urgent referral to ophthalmology or neurology service. And I think this one is because the, the paper where I, I uh, how to say, I uh, prepare my slide, they don't really admit all diplopia patients, but for us, uh, I think uh, we see a lot of diplopia that is referred by the emergency department, the, new, uh, the medical department, okay? So um, uh, I think we, we admit them, okay? But this is good for us to get some uh, knowledge, okay? So let's go to monoocular diplopia. Monoocular diplopia persists when one eye is closed. In contrast to binocular diplopia, which disappear when one eye is closed. Okay, so that means a person can come and tell you that oh, I can I see double. Okay, but you close the eye, you still see double. That means is this eye there is some problem with the lens or some refractive uh, uh, problem, okay? So monoocular diplopia, almost exclusively an eye problem, most commonly caused by benign entities such as dry eye or refractive error, okay? So you close this eye, they still see diplopia. You close this eye, there's no diplopia, eh? Why like that, okay? Because there is some maybe like a lens dislocation in this eye, so that's why you see diplopia, okay? Uh, versus if it's a binocular, that means they say they see diplopia. When you close one eye, they see, hey, you know, like they see they see clear already, no more diplopia. And then you close another eye, hey, they see clear already. So, you know, like that is binocular uh, issue. So monocular diplopia is not due to eye misalignment. Therefore, new, no neural imaging is needed, but we need to refer to the ophthalmologist uh, for for assessment and for treatment, okay? Is the diplopia isolated or is it associated with other neurological symptoms? It is very important whether patient has other neurological symptoms, especially if any brainstem symptoms are present. Brainstem symptoms such as acute onset of dizziness, vertigo, aphasia, ataxia, dysphagia, and presence of cross sign, especially cross sign. You mean ipsilateral cranial motor sign with contralateral hemiparesis. Sometimes you see that, eh, they have, uh, you know, like six nerve palsy of that side and then cross side of the hemiparesis of the other side. That means it's cross. It should prompt us, okay, whether it's a brainstem, uh, brain, brainstem involvement, okay? Should prompt one to consider brainstem as localization for the symptom of diplopia and urgent consideration of neuroimaging, preferably MRI, to detect early sign of stroke. And mobilization of stroke consult team should be done in all patients with diplopia and brainstem symptoms. Okay. Next, is there obvious abnormality of ocular mortality? Remember, I told you we will do a H sign, right? Like this. We ask the patient, okay, look at my eye, okay, look at my finger, okay, and then look to the right, up down, back again, then look to the other side again, up and down, okay? If it is determined that the diplopia is binocular without any associated neurological step, the next step will be to examine the ocular mobility. Examination should be done by slowly moving the examiner finger to different cardinal position of gaze while maintaining the patient head stationary. Check whether the eye can move all the way up now, right and left should be sufficient, okay? So if you just do a, a, a cross, okay, a plus sign is enough, okay? The purpose of checking, checking extraocular motility in ED is to determine whether there's any palsy of the third and sixth cranial nerve, okay? Okay, I'll show you figure one later, yeah? So the other thing is the motility compatible with sixth and third cranial nerve. Inability of the eye to AB duct should prompt examiner to consider whether it is a six nerve palsy. Okay, you look at that. Just look at the you know A, which is this one, not the down one, not the you know like the down down uh, what do you call that uh, figure. Just this one, this one, and this one. Okay, 
So look at the center first. So the eye is actually looking forward. So there is no misalignment. Now you're asking the patient to look to the left. So you can see both eyes look to the left, very uh, in an in aligned uh, position. Now we go to the other side. Now you ask the patient to look to the left, okay? This eye can adduct while this eye cannot adduct. So this person has a signal palsy of the left eye, right? Of the left eye, okay? So it's an isolated six nerve palsy, okay? So we go back to my slide. Adult patient with acute onset of diplopia with isolated adduction deficit should be referred for further evaluation of an ophthalmology. Usually these cases are caused by micro ischemia of the sixth cranial nerve and spontaneously will resolve. But if the palsy persists more than three months, an MRSA of the brain should be obtained to rule out a compressive lesion. Okay, now we go to what about if there is bilateral six nerve palsy? Bilateral six nerve palsy tend to be associated with more ominous etiology, such as raised intracranial pressure, maybe due to tumor, maybe due to hemorrhage, maybe due to hematoma, uh, and brainstem infarct. But other neurological abnormality will be expected in this patient, which need direct emergency ED workup. In children presenting with new abduction deficit, MRI should be obtained immediately because common compression is the co most common cause. Okay, so this is how we look at the uh, sixth cranial nerve. Okay, next is third cranial nerve palsy. A patient with complete third cranial nerve palsy will present with mediastic. Mediastic means dilated pupil ptosis that I means the eye will have will you know like there will be ptosis in one side okay the eye will be debated outwards and inability to look up and medially okay the eye will be okay let's look at this this way there how many crane how many uh eye muscle are there in our you know like uh how many extra ocular muscle are there in the eye in one eye would someone like to just type something? Is it four? Is it two? Is it eight? You know, like, okay, you can look up, you can look down, you can look to AB duct, AB duct. So you at least need four muscle, right? Well, wow, excellent. We load six, okay? Yeah. So you can look up, you can look down, you can look out, you can look in, right? And you got another two pair of muscle that we call inferior oblique and superior oblique. Okay, so again, you look up, then it's, it's a up, down, AB duct, and AD duct. So these, all these are rectus, uh, superior rectus, inferior rectus, lateral rectus, medial rectus. And you've got two extra muscle, which we call uh, uh, superior oblique and, and uh, inferior oblique. Okay, so what my lecturer in back in university taught us is, you know, like sometimes you cannot remember which nerve innervate which muscle, okay? So we've got three nerves that innervate the eyes, okay? So you've got three, four, six. Three, the third nerve actually can innervate a lot of muscle. So sometimes we can't remember. But you remember the, the four and the six to go because the six only innervate the lateral lectus, okay? And the four innervate the superior oblique. And the superior oblique, the, the function is actually to uh, look, okay, it, it oblique, and then when it superior oblique pull, the eye actually look down and then look out, okay? So, uh, uh, look in immediately, okay, look in, okay? So, uh, when, then the rest of the other nurse, so you got, you got six muscle, right? So, two muscle by three and uh, four and six already. Then the rest of the four is by the, the, the what do you call that, the, the third nerve. Lah. So that means when your third nerve is damaged, then your these two nerves will come in action. So that's why, because, uh, uh, because your third nerve cannot pull against the sixth nerve, so the eye will deviate outwards, okay? And because your third nerve cannot function and uh, uh, pull against your fourth nerve. That's why the fourth nerve will cause the eye to look down and to look laterally. Okay, down, up. Uh, how to say it? down and up. Then fourth nerve. 
So now your third nerve gone already. So you got your uh, fourth nerve in action. So that's why you cannot look up and you cannot look medially. Okay, so that's uh, when third nerve uh, palsy happened. Okay, oh dear, I think I confused you all because I'm confused myself. Never mind. <laughs> Anyhow, just remember that, you know, like if the eye has got dilated pupil, tosis, and then the eye look out and then cannot, you know, like the eye deviated outwards, think about third nerve palsy, okay? And this should be immediately evaluated with CT and CTA because it can be because of a compression, okay? Especially a neurism that arise at the pica, uh, pica artery, posterior inferior communicating artery. And this aneurysm can rupture and then it can cause death. Okay, so it is an emergency by itself, the third cranial nerve palsy. Okay, and uh, okay, so how about fourth cranial nerve? Actually, patients with fourth cranial nerve palsy usually do not harbor any sinister underlying pathology and it's difficult to diagnose by non-ophthalmology because you see, the eye has got six cranial nerve. The rest of the cranial nerves will actually compensate themselves. So a person who come to you, you know, with fourth cranial nerve, it's just a very subtle sign. Later, if we got time, I will show you a video. If not, then we just agak aga lah. Huh? If the person tell you that you got diplopia, because they usually present with vertical. Oops, sorry. This is fourth cranial nerve. Yeah. Oops, I forgot. Okay, so a fourth cranial nerve, a person, they usually present with vertical or oblique diplopia and would have near normal extraocular motility. And the most common etiology of fourth cranial nerve palsy is trauma or a decompensation of a congenital fourth nerve uh, palsy. Okay. And this patient should be referred to an ophthalmologist. Okay. And uh, what about there are multiple motility abnormality that could possibly due to involvement of more than one ocular motor nerve? This can be a difficult question to answer for an inexperienced examiner. Therefore, all patients whose ocular motility abnormality do not point to either sixth or third cranial nerve should be referred to an ophthalmologist or neurologist for further testing. And uh, if an emergency physician believes that the ocular motility abnormality are because of several ocular motor nerves, it is uh, appropriate to order an MRI, okay, to evaluate cavernous sinus disease or uh, uh, epic, obit, obit apex syndrome. In the absence of other neurological symptom or sign, it is safe for a patient to wait to see, especially who will be better equipped to perform careful ocular motility or ocular alignment testing, and come up with an appropriate differential diagnosis. Uh, uh, well, this is this statement. I take it from that paper of which I don't really uh, agree. To me, I think all. Uh, all, uh, how to say, cranial nerve that, uh, okay, all diplopia is quite emergency, if not uh, semi-emergency, okay, that need admission and quickly we do some investigation and then solve the problem, come up with diagnosis, okay, rather than wait for three months, okay. But this paper, actually, this paper I get it from Italy, it's an Italy paper in 2014. So it's a bit outdated. Now it's already 2022, but I thought it's quite good to, you know, like I follow the flow of how they come up with the six step examination. And, uh, okay, so uh, C, full blood count, ESR, C reactive protein. Patient more than 60 years old, we need to rule out giant cell arthritis. We need to do full blood count, erectus, ESR, and C reactive protein. Okay, so summary again. Simplified six-step approach to patient with diplopia to an ED. Number one is a diplopia monoocular or binocular. Any focal neurological sign. Do your H testing or your cross sign testing. Number three. Number four. Is this obvious sixth and third nerve palsy isolated? Okay. And then number five. Is there other cranial nerve involvement? Multiple. It's a complex. Okay. 
And then number six is remember your giant cell arthritis. This is the sixth step. Remember, uh, okay, uh, I'm going to randomly choose one participant. Uh. Okay, so come again, see? Diplopia, is it monoocular or binocular? If it's monocular, refer to ophthalmology. If it's binocular, and then there's other neurological signs such as hemiparesis, such as uh, dysphagia, giddiness, please, you know, stroke protocol. If it is uh, isolated diplopia, okay, I mean like when we saw patient, uh, a patient more than 60 years, please do ESR, C-reactive protein and full blood count. Then now we come to whether it's three, third nerve, six nerve or complex, okay? If it is a third nerve, do an urgent CT and CTA. If it is a six nerve palsy, refer neurology or ophthalmology, okay? If it's a complex mortality, mortality disorder, urgent MRI, urgent referral to neurology or ophthalmology because we need to do our cavernous sinus syndrome or uh, orbital apex syndrome, okay? Because all these are emergency as well. And you can only see the lesion if you do an MRI, okay? So when to image a patient with diplopia? So I, this is the paper that I, uh, I fall back on. Causes of diplopia in emergency department, diagnostic accuracy of clinical assessment and CT scan. Okay, actually is uh, 2014, Journal of Emergency Medicine, and it's Florence, Italy. Okay, so it's uh, in an Italian adult tertiary referral hospital with a staff comprising 22 emergency physicians. Patient older than 15 years old, uh, okay, the study period 2007 to 2009, which is three years, okay? And uh, in this three years, they have 180,000 patients in the ED, and again, 0.1% are double vision. That means they got around 207, 276, let's say 300. Lah. That means you got 100 patients per year. 100 patients per year, that means you will have how many per month? 10 per month with diplopia to emergency department. 10 per month divided by four, you will have two diplopia per week. Okay, so I think it's quite an important topic because you somehow you have two diplopia per week. Okay. Okay, so this is this okay result from all these 276 that they get, they have 167 has a primary diplopia, which is 64.2% which includes 7% with migraine with aura. What is primary diplopia? Later, I'll, I'll share with you all what is primary diplopia. Primary diplopia is a diplopia that we could not really find a uh, exact cause. That means, okay, like, uh, that means we do CT scan, we do MRI, eh, everything normal. Just now remember, I told you it can be due to stroke. It can be due to aneurysm of the PICA syndrome, remember? And then it can be due to cavernous sinus problem, you know? But all this that we do, CT scan normal, MRI normal, lumbar puncture normal, the full blood count normal, ESR not high, everything is normal, okay? These are the patients that we call primary diplopia, and uh, they have other definition to uh, diagnose primary diplopia. Later, we will go to that. And uh, usually, they will have one risk factor, such as sometimes they may have diabetes, some of them may have hypertension, dyslipidemia, at least one risk factor. And then the cause of this primary diplopia is uh, thought to be due to micro ischemia of the blood vessel that supply the nerve, you know, the vasa nervosa, right? Micro ischemia, okay? But then, uh, you know, like it's, it's a, a benign, has a benign prognosis. Lah. Secondary uh, diplopia was diagnosed in 35%. The most frequent diagnosis of secondary diplopia was stroke, okay? And uh, okay, the uh, ischemic stroke and then hemorrhagic stroke. Lah, uh. Multiple sclerosis is 18%, brain tumor 11%. Okay, seven patients have cerebral aneurysm and one has a cupid. And then there are other patients with various reasons, such as myasthenia gravis, also can present diplopia, Miller Fisher of Gurren Bale, pseudo tumor cerebri, which is your idiopathic IIH, idiopathic. Intracranial IIH, what do you call that? Uh, that means, uh, you know, like it, it's a raised intracranial pressure in the brain, benign intracranial hypertension. That means a raised intracranial in the brain thought to be benign, okay? Intracranial hypertension 2%, brain abscess 1, giant cell arthritis 1, 
carotid cavernous sinus fistula 2 percent. So this is uh, from that uh, uh, study from Italy. Binocular diplopia, 270 patients, 260 in the study. So isolated diplopia without associated sign and symptom, 11, uh, 118. And uh, primary cause is 105, secondary 30. And then diplopia with at least one sign and symptom, they are 142. This one, no other sign and symptom. Uh, primary diplopia is 62, secondary diplopia is 80. You can see here, if a person has got other sign and symptom, most likely there is a secondary cause. As you can see or not, you see, secondary diplopia and secondary diplopia here versus, okay. And uh, we found that different pathology can cause palsy or extraocular muscle. And uh, although in approximately two thirds of the diplopic patient, the final diagnosis is primary diplopia. So the free, most frequent diagnosis of second diplopia is ischemic stroke, multiple sclerosis, masses, tumor, and neurism. In clinical practice, when cardiovascular risk factors are present, peripheral microvascular ischemia is con considered pathogenic mechanism for primary diplopia. In this study, diabetes was significantly associated with di uh, primary diplopia. Of course, however, presence of diabetes do not exclude possibility of a diagnosis of secondary diplopia. When a patient comes to you with diplopia and diagnose, uh, diabetes, don't just say, okay, okay, this is, Dr. Irene says it's primary uh, diplopia. Don't say that, okay? It can still be secondary diplopia, okay? So always at the back of your mind, it can still be abscess. Why not, right? So do a thorough examination, okay? So uh, there's no difference in the frequency of risk factor between primary and secondary diplopia. Therefore, risk factor is not useful in predicting secondary diplopia. The presence of at least one sign uh, uh, highly specific for the diagnosis of secondary diplopia. Moreover, warning symptom also considered you good sensitivity. Okay, in patient present with at least one associated sign and symptom, plain CT scan is uh, warranted. Okay, to to identify uh, the secondary uh, diplopia. A normal CT scan should not include further diagnostic investigation, okay? Because 6% of them has a negative CT scan and then later, you know, like it come out, actually there are something in their brain. It has to be noted that CT scan is highly uh, specific in the diagnosis of secondary diplopia. All, uh, okay, so, okay, so, our Although there's no study, but the, the observation findings support traditional guidelines for imaging patients with new onset diplopia. And the guidelines suggest imaging all patients with evidence of additional neurological dysfunction of multiple cranial nerve neuropathy, in particular patients with incomplete or pupil involving the cranial nerve palsy, okay, which school should be imaged immediately. Also, uh, guidelines also suggest imaging patients younger than 50 years of age and those history with any type of cancer because it can be metastasis. In the rest of patients with isolated diplopia, imaging should be performed when diplopia progresses or has not resolved three months after the initial visit. Okay. So the criteria for microvascular peripheral ophthalmoplegia, which is your primary uh, ophthalmoplegia, is based on the following cri uh, criteria. Isolated third nerve palsy, which is uh, uh, pupil sparing, ESL less than 30, age 50 and older, at least one of the uh, risk factors, okay? So, OPEX, orbital apex, okay? Orbital apex is the most posterior part of the orbis, of the eye, is the most posterior part, and there are uh, many important structures that pass through that, including all the extraocular muscle, uh, erectus muscle, sympathetic fiber, cranial nerve, three, four, six, the first and the second branch of cranial nerve five. And the optic canal, we contain the optic nerve, okay? Note the optic nerve, okay? Later we will come to that, you know, like in, in this optic nerve, we will, I will talk more about that. Optic nerve is actually second, okay? It's two. This one, uh, three, four, six is the, the, the one that moves the eye. The one that makes you see is the second, okay? The second uh, cranial nerve two. A wide variety of pathology can affect the orbital apex, including infection, uh, inflammation, neoplasm, trauma, or thyroid eye disease. Can you imagine this is your eye, okay? This is your orbit. And then at the end of it, there is your apex there. So anything can happen, right? You can have infection there, abscess there, tumor there, right? So proptosis may signal an extra corner mass, 
in the case of orbital apex syndrome, please do a CT scan of the orbits with contrast. <coughs> Sorry. It will help you in, uh, you know, like uh, pick up a lot of pathology. What about cavernous sinus? Okay. Cavernous sinus are a pair sinuses located at the base of the, this is the pituitary fossa. This is the cavernous sinus. So the cranial nerve three, four, six, and the first and second division of cranial nerve five, sympathetic nerve, internal carotid artery, all travel through the cavernous sinus, which serve as a major drainage for ophthalmic vein. So this cavernous sinus actually a very, very important structure. Ah, uh, not here. Okay. How do you, you know, as because you see, like uh, if a person got three, four, six cranial nerve problem, then you are suspecting whether it's an orbital apex syndrome or is it cavernous sinus syndrome. How do you differentiate? This is just, you know, like a, 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 a suggestion. Okay. It's not foolproof. I say, oh, it has to be that. Okay. Huh? It can be distinguished from the cavernous sinus by the involvement of optic nerve. Okay. Uh, which is the uh, which acuity. Cavernous sinus lies away from the optic nerve. Therefore, in cavernous sinus problem, visual acuity is usually not affected. If a person comes to you with a visual acuity, that means blurring, cannot see, not only diplopia, but also cannot see. Think about orbital effects. Okay. And then there are some patients, you know, like the eye is so, you know, like it looks congested, and then totally the eye is static there, and then out and run like that. But you'll be surprised, the, 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 the visual acuity can see so well. Uh. Then you, you, well, how come the eye is so bad, but then can see so well? Uh? Uh, then you bet, better think whether it's cavernous sinus or not, because the second cranial nerve actually doesn't go into the cavernous sinus, okay? I'm going to show you a diagram here. So you see here, okay? So this is your, you know, like, uh, this is the orbit, uh, epical, orbit, orbit apex, okay? So you have your three, four, the third nerve, the, the okay, the, the 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 purple one is the third nerve come out, okay. The blue one is the fourth nerve come out, see. And then this box here is actually our cavernous sinus. This is your orbit uh, apex. This is the eye, okay. And then this is your sixth nerve, and then the green one come, okay. So it travel in the cavernous plus go out to the orbit apex. This is the apex, right, okay. Uh, where's your second cranial nerve? See, this is your second cranial nerve. It doesn't go inside your cavernous sinus. So it go, 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 go. See? So if it's the orbit apex problem, you will have, uh, uh, you know, like blurring of vision. Okay. But it's not, say, fubrosa. Huh? It's just agak agak lah. Huh? So you have another, the fifth cranial nerve here. You see a uh, fifth cranial nerve, your second, the first and your second branch. Okay actually go through the cavernous sinus, okay? Yes. Also your orbit effects, but your, the third, okay? Uh, third, fifth nerve, that means, you know, like you got your trigeminal, okay? One and two, but then the, the third one is not, is not involved in this cavernous and also your uh, uh, orbit, okay? So again, you see your internal carotid artery go into your cavernous sinus, see, okay? And then where is, okay, then this cavernous sinus itself is a venous drainage by itself, okay? So, but then your, your internal carotid doesn't touch your orbit, right? Epical orbit, right? Okay, so a serious complication that can affect cavernous sinus is the septic cavernous sinus thrombosis, okay? Usually caused by direct spread of infection from adjacent structures such as periorbital, cellulitis, etc. Due to impact drainage from autonomic vein, patients present with eyelid swelling, proptosis, chemosis, and autonomia. And a lot of time, you will have bilateral eye finding because cavernous sinus, both of them are actually in direct communication with one another, okay? Versus your uh, apical orbit, I'm not sure. We have autonomology later, we can ask him, okay? Whether the, uh, you know, like the orbits apex they, they will spread to TV. It's an appropriate uh, 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 imaging, and then uh, you can see a filling defect. And then blood culture, CSF finding. Okay, so in majority of patients with binocular diplopia, 
uh, despite a battery of investigation, no organic cause is found. So you call it primary diplopia. According to literature, primary diplopia has a good prognosis, cell limiting, and does not require specific therapy. Okay, just now, remember how many of the diplopia are actually uh, primary diplopia? 60%. Okay, unfortunately, diplopia in some cases may be the first manifestation of a, a neurological systemic disease that can be uh, uh, result in poor outcome. So, you know, high index of suspicion is important. So, look at that. This one. So, these are all the primary, secondary, with da 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 da. So, primary, at least 60% of them are actually primary diplopia. So, conclusion the presence of other sign is a good sensitivity for identification of secondary diplopia. In this patient, plain CT scan can identify the underlying pathology. But if the plain CT scan is normal, further diagnostic investigation is warranted. More than 40% of patients with no other signs and symptoms, this group of patients has low okay, incidence of secondary diplopia and is categorized by good short-term prognosis. A properly designed study may be should be carried out to evaluate the safety of discharging from ED a patient with isolated uh, diplopia after having to carry out a detailed assessment of medical history and uh, examination. So, okay, so uh, I think I have uh, almost finished my talk now. Um, have I overshoot my time, Dr. Chow? Nope, nope. Okay, well, uh, Still have uh, 20 minutes. Oh, okay. I'm giving one hour, is it? Yeah. But I'm almost finished. So it's the interactive time. Okay, I'm going to choose. Can I choose or Dr. Chow, you want to choose? <laughs> um, I <didn't> go ahead. <laughs> yeah. So I'm going to choose and uh, ask the person to tell me, okay, uh, uh, okay, uh, what are the six uh, steps? Okay. Uh, let's go through again. So uh, I think we got a variety of medical officer here. So when I call out your name, can you please uh, tell me? Uh, which uh, your position, whether you are MO, specialist, or consultant, if I choose wrongly. I, I saw Dr. Wan Asraf is here. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. So you tell me whether you are MO. It, it tell us your full name. Like, uh, okay, I am Dr. Wesley. Okay. And then, uh, or there is a WHL. Okay. So maybe you want to tell me I'm Dr. Lee. Okay. And then uh, I'm from Hospital Bukit Mataja. And then you can say I'm a medical officer. And if you like to give a bit in a uh, brief introduction of yourself, also can. And uh, okay, okay uh, I'm from Hospital Bukit Metajam, and uh, okay, uh, which department, right? Huh? Uh, I'm from medical department, emergency department, or family medicine. Okay, and uh, okay, and if you want to tell us how many years uh, uh, as an MO, that would be also good, you know. But I will not penalize lah. So I don't know whether Dr. Chow Chi Tong have any price or anything for the one who, uh, you know, who give the, the correct uh, six step uh, uh, neuro ophthalmology assessment. So number one, let's go through again. Monoocular or not? Any focal neurological sign to suggest it's strong or not? Okay, then we do the, the uh, H, uh, eye muscle motility test. Number four, we ask whether there is an isolated third nerve and sixth nerve uh, palsy. Or number five, multiple cranial nerves involvement. And then number six is age 60. Okay. You all memorized already? Can I choose already now? Yeah. Dang, 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 dang. I'm going to choose. I'm going to choose the one that put very funny name or the name which is, you know, like, don't know what it is. Yeah, yeah, 07. I really have to stop sharing first. Okay. okay. You're sharing the answer. <laughs> okay, okay, yeah, let's share. Stop sharing. Okay. Uh, maybe I share, but. but uh, Okay, okay, never mind. Uh, no need to share. You can share like let me share, but uh but I don't show the answer. Yeah. Okay, show the eye. Okay, I saw Yaya 07. Uh don't exit that uh, after I call your name. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, good morning everyone. I'm uh uh, my name is Ixi Yakub. I think I forgot to rename my uh, uh, rename my username there. Yeah. Don't get angry, Okay. So, uh, where are you? Which hospital are you from? I'm. I'm. Uh, my name is Yakub. I'm working in a uh, hospital Sandakan. Oh. Okay. Emergency. Uh, emergency uh, department lah. Uh, MO for 
two years, I think. Yeah. Okay, good, good. That's good. So would you like to, Jacob, would you like to tell us the six step? Yeah, I'll just brief through uh, whatever that I remember. Yes, don't so, worry. Yeah, uh -huh. so when uh, whatever I remember is when the patient comes to us complaining of uh, diplopia, we just need to make sure, um, is it uh, monoocular or bi binocular? And yes. then we need to also determine whether is it, if binocular, we need to determine whether it's uh, isolated. Yes. And then subsequently, uh, with this diplopia, if the patient also having any other um, secondary, any other uh, focal neurological symptoms that suggest um, CBA, so we need we might need to uh, get a CT brain for the patient to rule out sure. the secondary cause of the diplopia. Okay. And, and then um, if, let's say, it's only isolated to the eye, yeah. it's only diplopia, we, we perform the uh, EOM, uh, 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 extra ocular muscle uh, test for the patient, so yeah. that when we do that, we can identify whether is it uh, isolated uh, third, fourth, or even sixth um, uh, nerve pulses. So if let's say it's isolated uh, nerve, especially third nerve, then we might want to get a, a urgent uh, again imaging throughout yeah. any um, uh, any uh, any uh, what to? any uh, compressions, any any yeah. aneurysm uh, or things like that. Yes. And then, uh, if let's say we, we cannot like properly identify, or oh, it's actually third or fourth or sixth, it actually comes in a mix, then uh, uh, probably uh, need, need a referral to yes. the ofta. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you got five points already, the last point, age of the patient. Oh, okay, okay. Uh, we need to uh, take um, uh, some investigation. Because uh, uh, elderly patients, they are having a risk of uh, arthritis. So we need to uh, work, out, work out on that. And if we think it's uh, arthritis, we need to give the patient on steroids. Yes, excellent. Very good. Okay. So, uh, Chachitong, you tell the Sandakan PD and say, you know, the, the boss, okay? So he remember what I said. Well done. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, yeah, Dr. Yakob. Okay. Thank Please. you, Dr. We will choose another one. I think my time is at. Please don't get upset huh? if you cannot remember. It's okay because I'm also a slow learner myself. Every time when I listen to lecture, I forget, you see. Uh, but uh, but I what I do is I repeat and I repeat and I repeat and I don't feel shy. I will speak out, you know. And if I cannot remember, I just say, oh, I cannot. I just try my best to remember. No, but everyone can be like Yakub, you know, can blah, 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 whatever uh, the lecture. Okay, now we, we got uh, M. Who is this M? Very interesting. M, we have M in our participant. Would you like to unmute yourself? Yeah, Dr. Irene Murshida here from HUKM. Oh, hi. Uh, you are, may I know your, this one? You are? I'm a medical officer. Okay. Uh, doing internal medicine, uh, in master internal medicine okay. in HUKM. Okay, sure. So would you like to tell us about the six step? Oh, okay, sure. So the six step uh, in approach to ophthalmoplegia, yeah. uh, when patient came in with uh, diplopia, first we need to see whether this patient have monoocular or binocular. Yeah. Then uh, assess for any associated neurological symptoms, okay. uh, especially any brainstem symptoms. Excellent. Then we check for extraocular movement, Excellent. DH test. Okay. Then we see whether the, uh, when we check extraocular movement, we see whether the patient have isolated third nerve palsy or sixth nerve palsy. Excellent. Then if patient have isolated third nerve palsy, uh, he may need urgent CTA uh, to look for any aneurysm, uh, aneurysmal compression. Sure. Then uh, if uh, the extraocular movement is like complex ophthalmoplegia, uh, multiple nerve involvement, then uh, this patient may need MRI to evaluate for any cavernous sinus or vital effect syndrome. Excellent. Um, may need CACT orbit as well. Sure. Then uh, if patient is more than 60 years old with binocular diplopia, uh, we may need to think of the iron cell arthritis does need further biochemical tests and also uh, treatment with hydrosteroid. Good. 
very good. So all can good can can uh, present lecture already lah. I think I think I uh I don't want to ask further lah. All of you has can remember well the lecture. So uh, I think I'll pass the mic back to Dr. Chow Chi Tong. Hey, thank you, Dr. Irene. Uh, Dr. Irene, can you answer some questions? Okay, sure. Where is that? Right. Uh, so Nina has one question to ask you. Sure, hey. sure. Uh, hi, Dr. Irene. Thank you for your excellent talk. Okay, I have two questions. Uh, number one, uh, well, uh, if you go a bit at once, we have the medical technopathy and surgical technopathy, right? Yeah. So if uh, from the history taking itself, the suggestive of more of medical technopathy is a CT angiogram uh, really warranted for this type of population? That's number one. Uh, number two, how frequent does a multiple sclerosis presented with uh, 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 diplopia instead of a uh, uh, blurry of vision due to optic neuritis? Okay, very good question. So CTA for third nerve, uh, for third, uh, for surgical third nerve, uh, for medical third nerve. Okay, if it's a yeah. surgical third nerve, of course we will do a CTA. But uh, if it is a medical third nerve, would we do a CTA or not? Uh, I think it is individualized. Uh, personally, I myself, I will do. Okay, so I, uh, uh, but even though I know that the yield may not be high, okay, because however you cannot go out, because if I do a CT scan play, okay, uh, it, it, it doesn't show. But if I do a CTA, you know, like I, I'm just a bit kiasu lah, as you can see, this one. Then your second question is uh, multiple sclerosis presented with diplopia. Uh, I think uh, it is quite common. Uh, if you got time, maybe I can show some paper. Because you see the multiple sclerosis. Uh, uh, okay, your question is good in blurring of mission because of the optic neuritis, right? But then, mind you, uh, uh, multiple sclerosis also involve the brainstem and also the salivella. They are, you know, and then you have all your, your cranial nerve uh, nucleus located at the brainstem. Mm -hmm. So that's why it is quite common for them to have diplopia as well. I can show you. Just give me one moment. Huh? Oh, okay. I just, uh, you know, I, I, I didn't include that in the presentation, but then they actually talk about uh, multiple sclerosis. I need to share. Okay, I want to highlight to you is in patient with multi. Can you see right? Yes, yes. Okay, in patient with multiple sclerosis, the most common mortality mortality abnormality is the internuclear ophthalmopedia (IFO), which can be found up to fifty three percent of multiple sclerosis at some point in their clinical course. INO is caused by a lesion in the, you know, like MLF at the brainstem, okay? And then connecting the, you know, is responsible connecting the third cranial nerve and the sixth cranial nerve, okay? And, okay. So INO, okay? So uh, patient with present INO should be referred to neurology for systemic evaluation the MRI. CT scan is not helpful in evaluating the lesion in the posterior fossa. That's why it's not useful in evaluating patient with INO. That's a very good question. Yeah. Any other question? Um, can I ask just one last more? One, one last question. Um, is uh, whether the patient has painful uh, diplopia or painless diplopia, would it help in uh, narrowing the diagnosis? Yes, of course. If it's a painful diplopia, uh, I, if, uh, personally, I would think that it's quite uh, sinister that uh, whether it is uh, uh, something inflammation or something infection that is uh, uh, going on. Uh, because if it's inflammation or infection, then it will be painful, you know, like especially apical uh, or, uh, or be apical lesion, you know, like there, were, there is a lesion there. So, uh, but I think, uh, you see, like the six step we didn't really include pain, you know, like, so we want to make it easy for for, sure. for to memorize. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hey, Dr. Arin, I have one question. Uh, can you uh, elaborate further on a vertical and a oblique diplopia? Okay. Uh, oh, very, very. <laughs> okay, vertical and oblique diplopia. 
uh, hmm. can you mean like uh, explain as in yeah. like the yeah. aspect or or you know or the you know like the pathophysiology the I mean, SOL. Huh? I mean, I mean uh, uh, what what do you mean by uh, vertical and oblique hypopia? Uh, I, I mean, like my knowledge is limited. Uh, later, maybe we can ask the ophthalmologist, you know, like detail to explain to us. Okay, so uh, that means you know, like if you have diplopia, if it's a horizontal, that means your 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 images is this way, right? Two. Okay, one is the real, the other one is the false images. But if you have vertical, I think it's up and down. Correct or not? Yeah. Okay. Then if you have oblique, that means the the diplopia, the images actually they are sideways. Okay, rather than you know like very good uh, uh with the uh, horizontal that way so i i hope i explain thank you the diary You're yeah. uh anyone has any other questions okay if no questions uh, uh what's the uh, thank you very much, Dr. Irene, for the Welcome. wonderful uh, sharing and presentation. Welcome. Uh, I see uh, Prof. Hazaba is here already. Um, ciao, ciao. Ciao, yeah. let me just uh, unrecord then record again so that we will have okay. two sessions recorded uh, separately. All right, all right, uh, sure. Then, yeah? All right. Okay.